And yes, here we are again. It's the annual Noel Gallagher end of term catch up. Just Noel uh, and some records and a few stories uh, and thoughts from the year behind us and the one ahead. Welcome back. I suppose that's actually it's really quite a good place to start, David Bowie, because I guess Bowie's death has sort of has cast something of a long shadow really over a lot of this year. Yeah, well, him and, him and Prince in the same year was yeah. staggering, really, when you think of it. You know, after he'd been away for so long and come back and. Um, yeah, it's a real shocker. I guess maybe this year will be remembered, but it's been the craziest year. Like, mm. I can remember f- politics and you know people dying and stuff like that, and world events. But David Bowie dying, yeah, it's, in a way, he'll probably never die, you know what I mean? Because his music was such a part of people's lives. Yeah. But um, yeah, this year, him and Prince, I mean, I was about to go on stage when I was sat in the canteen at the Hydro in, in Glasgow, right. eating beans on toast, as the BBC ticker tape come across his pics of Prince. I look at it thinking, oh, what's he up to, you know? I'm like, wow, he's dead. I couldn't believe it. That's a downer before we've started the evening. Yeah. People were calling me saying, you've got to do something. You're kind of going on stage in, I think it's like an hour and a half. Yeah. So we kind of kind of did a bit of a tribute to him. But it was strange, you know, a weird year, like Lemmy as well. And yeah. An old friend of mine, Craig Gill from Inspiral Carpets. Yeah, of recently. course, yeah. Funny old year for people reaching the end. There you go. Bowie um, first came into your life where? What was the first Bowie record that um, made any impact on you? First thing I ever, ever heard of David Bowie was when I was on the dole in Manchester in, I think I'd just left school, so it would be 1983. There used to be a thing on... It might have been on Channel 4, it's called Five Minute Profile. Right. And I distinctly remember there being one of Fleetwood Mac and hearing Oh Well for the first time and thinking, wow, they got the Fleetwood Mac. And I really got into the old, like, Peter Green, Fleetwood Mac, that. David Bowie was on. Heroes was the one that struck me. And you probably have always heard of David Bowie and Top of the Pops and all that, but I remember seeing the video for Heroes. And it's a quick five minute trawl through somebody's musical life. The Heroes thing blew me away. And then went and got whatever the best of was at the time, Changes yeah. 1 and 2 or whatever it yeah. was. And quickly become obsessed by them. When I was a roadie for Inspiral Carpets and just starting with Oasis, being on the cusp of being a songwriter, I had a cassette which I used to bring with me everywhere which had, in order, two David Bowie songs, two T-Rex songs and two Slade songs, one after the other, really? for an hour and a half. I used to bore the Inspirals <laughs> to death. With, you know, Mama, we're all crazy now. Yeah. I, I might have been the only person in the world that noticed that it's the actual same arrangement and chords as it's only rock and roll by the Stones, which I always <laughs> give myself a little musical pat on the back for that. So you were essentially living in the, at the start of the 70s at that point, in your head, Indeed. in your musical Yeah, taste. well, yeah, if you listen to the sound of Definitely Maybe, it's yeah. kind of, yeah. it's a bit Slade, you know? Yeah. I always thought we were more like Slade than the Beatles. But, yeah. Um, That's look- a good, that Bowie song is great, because there are so many different levels to it, and particularly when the that low, ominous bass line... Well, that album, in. Heathen, is nobody checks for it. You know, I'm not sure how well it did when it came out. I'm not sure I even bought it when it came out. Uh, I've only really started listening to it recently, but that mm. track's incredible. Yeah. But, you know, the, I think is the the second last record he made, The Next Day, is a masterpiece. When I remember when I first got it, and I remember listening to it just lying on the bed with headphones and thinking, can't be this good. <laughs> so I listened to it like three or four times in a row, and I was calling people saying, have you heard this Bowie record? And I said, is it, is it me? Or yeah. is it amazing? Yeah. And they were saying, yeah, it's pretty good. And there's some of the stuff on there, some of the best stuff he's done, I think. Yeah. But do you think a record like that in this day and age gets the credit it deserves? Because, you know, sometimes not all the audience are going to listen to it in the same way. You listen to it in the same way you would have listened to a, a Smith's album, start to finish, hold the sleeve, and then start working out the records, you know, like we and spend time with it. Yeah, but there's not many people like us left in the world, though, is there? My daughter's generation, my daughter's 16 now. Right. They uh, are not remotely interested when i was making chasing yesterday she's run at my house and i was late getting in from a meeting and i came in with a big folder under my arm of the artwork and i said oh she'd been there phrase and i said oh sorry mate. i've been in a meeting about artwork for the record and she went artwork <laughs> i said what's that and i went you know the artwork and she said artwork what is it though and i went well it's the cover of the record and she went the cover of the record I can't so I kind of quickly got an iPad out and I said, all right, see this, see the little picture there? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, that is this big. And she went, wow, they have yeah. meetings for that. <laughs> and I was like, meetings for it? You could spend hundred grand on that in an afternoon. That's no messing. You could drop a quarter of a mil doing a cover. She's like, wow, 
course. <laughs> you know, she's now got into vinyl. Yeah. And she's... You know, oh, that's good news, though, isn't it? Yeah, I bought her... <clears> but I'm not sure she was too pleased when I bought her a record player for her 16th birthday. I think she was expecting, like, a Fiat Punto or something. <laughs> Other mid price cars are available. as one well on the BBC. But she might have been expecting a car or something. Look, well, we've bought you a record player. She's like, oh, great, just what I've always wanted. And then we start a pack of albums. Yeah. What was in the starter pack? The Stone Roses... Uh, there might have been one or two Oasis records in mm-hmm. there. Probably, yeah, definitely, yeah. maybe Morning Glory. The last, I just thought the last one, bit of, you know, the best of the Beatles, of course, <laughs> the best album. <laughs> yeah. um, some David Bowie. Uh, I can't remember now specifically what it was. She's very much into it now. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It would have been better if she'd had a record player like your first record player. Was it when you came in a couple of years ago? Your first record player it was a vertical, vertical record, record player yeah, you put by, on the wall yeah, by yeah. Bush. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, talking about uh, previous last year when we spoke, if I remember rightly, you just got a dog and you were about to move house. Is that right? Is that last year? Yes, we moved house. Right, and it's incredible. Right, the dog. Oh dear, the dog didn't go the distance. I'm afraid. No, because Tommy. Thomas. Thomas. Thomas was very mean to the cat. Oh. And the cat had been around for a long time. Right. It was like, look, this is not fair, man. No. He's gone to a better home, <laughs> which the kids were not best pleased about. Right. I wasn't that bothered myself. Because, right. to be quite honest, my wife was showing him more affection than me. I'll never forget once I came in for, I don't know where I've been, and as I came in the front door, I could hear from downstairs my missus saying, where have you been? Have you been out? Oh, look at your old cold. And I was thinking, that's nice. She's never really like that, you know what I mean? My missus, because she's Scottish, you know what I mean? You know, she's like, oh, God, come here, you. And then I quickly realised that the dog had come in at the same time through the kitchen door, and she was talking to the dog, and I thought... <laughs> no, no, this house isn't big enough. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> this, is, this is not going to work, I'm afraid. And we used to have great conversations with your missus, you know, and then she'd suddenly be like, you know, she looks like she's taking a notice of what you're saying. Yeah. And you'd be like, yeah, yeah, she'd be going, yes. And then she'd suddenly go, Tommy! And you'd be like, oh, she's not listening to a word I'm saying. It's constantly like being at an after-show party where someone's actually, you think that you're talking to them, but actually they're looking behind you at somebody else. That's it. Yeah. When you move into a new gaff, somebody comes around to do uh, some work, do they like to have a bit of a chat? Some people do. The postman usually likes a chat. Oh, do you know what? I wrote this down. Well, I wrote it down and then realised, I can't say to Noel, do you have a relationship with your postman? That just West- sounds wrong. He's a, yeah, he's a West but- Ham fan. I can tell you that he's not best pleased about the move to the new stadium. Is he not? No, good. Uh, he's not best pleased with the owners. He'll support them all his life through thick and thin. Doesn't really matter. He hopes they survive this season. <laughs> he's still holding your parcel at this yeah. point. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Listen, absolutely. He goes everywhere with them. Been home and away for 40 years. That's not going to stop. Uh, he's a bit sad that they don't get to drink in the same pubs round the bowling ground, as you used to call it. I sympathise. Uh, yeah, good lad, though. You know, and he's, and he's dropping off a little, you know, a little tiny thing about this big, <laughs> yeah. which contains a voucher for someone that you don't want. Well, obviously, my postman must have at some point, because he turns up and the letterbox is too small for a 12-inch single. So, obviously, he realises, mm, it must have something to do with music. And I think he must have gone away and Googled, because now you get occasional conversation, we get questions about the BBC and radio and pop, what pop music's like at the moment, how it used to be much better. Mm. And it's a bit chilly on the step these days. Absolutely. So, you don't mind it in the summer, <laughs> you know. The but, but like in the in, in the winter you're just like give us the thing <laughs> and let's go on with it because I've got soft paws on the telly there you know <laughs> <laughs> you uh, also uh, when you came in last year I, we didn't know because I think it started running about a day after we recorded this last year we didn't know you had the John Lewis advert wasn't allowed to say no see. but was there a point because it suddenly occurred to me and it's a long run up to Christmas mm. you know you come in sit down of an evening switch the telly on what point do you think oh no not again Oh. Never. No. <laughs> Never. I can safely say that every time it come on, we'd go, we should go on holiday. That paid for the removal, man. Yeah. There uh, were, um, I have to thank uh, another person who's passed this year, Carolina Hearn, you know what mm. I mean? She's a friend of mine. And I was saying to people, she kind of, her and Craig kind of, that, that song may have slipped into obscurity had mm. they not chosen it quite randomly for the royal family. Mm. That song is just, just another Oasis B-side has taken on a life of its own mm. all over the world. And... When uh, the good people from John Lewis, the guy who looks after it now is clearly our age as an Oasis fan, <laughs> they said they want to use it for the ad. Are you okay with that? 
<laughs> well, just give me a second to think about it. Yes, I'm fine with it. Yeah. But it will be forever synonymous with Christmas now, which I'm cool with, actually. Yeah. yeah. And it is, I mean, it's one of those songs, and particularly this year, it's become increasingly poignant over the years as well. It's odd how some of your songs take on a different sort of meaning in different contexts, and as you say, they now well, they yeah, mean yeah. something. People have been saying that with the film, the Supersonic mm. film. I guess as you travel on through life, and all our youths are way behind us, when you see something like that, and the world was doing all right without technology. We didn't really need phones or cameras or computers. We kind of got through by word of mouth and soul. And when you look back and you see, uh, particularly for me, when I was watching the, the as the film was being made, the sea of humanity of people, not a single phone. Yeah. Like people in the moment yeah. with the band, that was it. You fast forward five, ten years and... You know, there's just a sea of, of yeah. phones. I think the songs bring you back to the times when we were all 25 years younger and had all this in front of us, you know. The songs at the time were all about, they were kind of melancholic and they were kind of happy, sad anthems. I guess they take on more yeah. meaning. I'd like Live Forever, certainly, you know, yeah. particularly this year. Yeah. Timeless music, see? <laughs> You don't get out of menswear. <laughs> I'd like to talk a bit about High Flying Birds actually bringing things slightly more up to date in a second. But another of your choices first, Shocking Blue, uh, who were a Dutch band. I looked them up. Are they really? Yeah. Do, I, do you know? Do you know Nirvana's Love Buzz? Mm. It's not Nirvana's Love Buzz. That's Shocking Blue's Love, yeah, love, I'm love Buzz. I never, I never, I never, I never knew any of these things. Anyway, this is by uh, Shocking Blue, and this is called Mighty Joe. <laughs> It's shocking blue, that's mighty Joe. Just before you say anything about this record, before you tell us about it, um, I've got a picture here. I'll, I'll just pass this to you. Look, take a, take a look at that. That's uh, shocking blue. Oh, From left to right, Gaz Coombs, yes. a young Richard Ashcroft yeah. and Claudia Winkleman. <laughs> Well, I don't know who the guy on the right, far right is. Oh, he's is. every every bass player that ever was <laughs> in the nineties. That guy, isn't he? Yeah, Gaz. It really looks like Gaz Coombs in that photo, doesn't he? Yeah, they yeah. look great. <laughs> yeah, don't know. They were, what were they Dutch? You said Dutch. Yeah, I don't. I don't know of many Dutch bands. Betty Severe, Golden Earring. That's all I know. Uh, where did you come across that? I think I might actually have the best of Shocking Blue. Have you? Yeah. The reason that I put it on for this, I was watching a thing about. Morrissey recently right it was the sound better that and I was thinking I've got that got that track somewhere yeah found it stuck it on it's like well, it's got a great guitar riff yeah you know yeah last year we spoke well actually not last year year before which was just before the second High Flying Birds album came out and uh, I said at the end of uh, the, the hour uh, will he come back and say well in fact this is what I said and this is what you said okay. It's uh, thrown us up some terrific music in this hour. Thank you so much for bringing us all these. And uh, good luck with the record. Hopefully we'll see you again around March time when, yes. uh, when the album comes out. When oh, good Lord, I'll be flogging that horse for about a year. <laughs> don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out to be slightly longer than a year, though, isn't it? You've been out. You've, you've oh, toured. When did, you, when did you finish touring this I album? I finished, yeah, maybe six, seven, eight weeks ago. It was a long tour, but I've got to say, as we came to the end of it... Mm. I could have done another six months. It was really great. There was... Because you'd, you'd done an American tour last year, and you almost seemed surprised by how enjoyable it was. You, you sounded like you'd had a really good time in the States. Yeah. The thing about that country is, when I first went in my 20s, I didn't like it at all. I always felt I was going to get arrested for either smoking in the wrong place or ordering a drink past midnight. And there was too many rules. You know, like when you're young and you're, you've got so much, you know, youth in you... America's not the place for young people, but the, as soon as I turned, like, 30, I was like, and you start to slow down, I was like, oh, I get it now. And I remember being in, I hated LA, nobody on the streets, everyone in Kai, couldn't, there was no vibe to it at all. As soon as I turned 35 and started getting an achy back, I was like, I get, <laughs> kind of there making a record for a bit, and thought, I get, I get why they all live here now, you know what I mean? Yeah. The big salad, you know, and the beach, and it never rains, and everybody's absurdly happy i've got to say man i really love touring there because the people are so nice that they don't have to have a, a barrier at the gigs so they're kind of right there and all the gigs are seated so they so they're there to listen do you know what i mean yeah you know there's nothing better than stopping at a truck stop in the middle of nowhere at you know four in the afternoon after you've been on a bus for three and a half days <laughs> some guy turning to you at the bar saying you all australian it's like, <laughs> yes we are <laughs> Yes, we are. We are all Australian. <laughs> and um, you did quite a few festivals over the last mm. couple of years, this year. Yeah. You? And do you, have you got a festival routine now? Eat before you go on site. I don't, I don't imagine, I can't imagine you in catering. Depends. I don't eat before I go on anyway. I'm not great going on stage. Particularly singing on a full stomach is not to be um, 
recommended. It depends. You got if you arrive on the bus if it's raining, brilliant. You just stay on the bus. Uh, if there's somebody on that you want to see, run down to see them. I don't really. I did a, a runner festival towards the end of the last tour. All these like little boutique ones they call yeah. them up north yeah. so there's like 25 30 thousand people i've got to say man they were amazing i did a festival in um scarborough right i should have taken a picture of the poster because the poster it was a a season of gigs in this uh it's the biggest open air arena in europe and it's in scarborough i'll never forget we had to drive up the tour bus kind of drive up this little thing on scarborough beach and, and i took a picture from mrs out of the tour bus and she said God, it's like a painting because there was one guy. It was you shouldn't have been on the beach in Scarborough. It was cold, right? But there yeah. was people there in their undies, in puddles of water. And there was one guy with one of those, uh, you know, those windbreaker things that you can clearly <laughs> buy for about four quid in the shop. Yeah, it's like got two, three sticks of bamboo and a stripy thing, and he was stood there <laughs> with his hands on his hips, with a can of lager as this tour bus was going past. <laughs> Thinking, look, tour bus, eh? Look at the tour, eh? Betty, tour bus, eh? Look at this. Who's this? Rod Stewart. And we were in hysterics, you know. And he's like, there was a yeah, there was a Union Jack planted on the beach. Yeah, of course. You know, and uh, we turned this thing, and it was a, a, a summer of gigs, and I was in between Status Quo, Tony Adley, Noel Gallagher's I Flying Birds, <laughs> and Brian Adams, and I thought to myself. Hey, they've they've cracked it now that mob, haven't they? Yeah. Hey, doing the same gigs as me. And there was a girl at the front of the gig. She looked like an exploited fan. She had like what, like a Mohican, like a, a punk gothic rock, makeup punk on, rocker. right? And a big multicoloured skin, a multicoloured black lipstick. And I kind of after the first song, I just said to her, "Not being funny, Are you at the wrong gig." You know, she turned around with a leather jacket. It's a massive Oasis thing written on the back of this leather really? jacket. I was like, wow, what, what side of it was she listening to? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Not live forever. Come on. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, we'll talk more about High Flying Birds and what uh, lays ahead in the future, but here's another new record. Well, I was going to say another new record. This is uh, one of Noel's records. This one's a new one, though, and it's from Manchester. White Horses. Are they from Manchester? Yeah, they are. I have no idea. But, like, yeah, somebody, from Manchester. Somebody, uh, David Holmes, who I'm working with at the minute, sent me, I think he might have produced it, sent me that record. He sent it to me in the wonders of technology. Yeah. And, uh... Oh, I thought you, I thought it was another one your postman had delivered. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, 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 I, it was, uh, he sent it to me, and the first track uh, reminded me of that Jack Nietzsche track. Nietzsche track I oh, played yeah. Last, last year, the, yeah. the Lonely Surfer. Yeah. White Horses, pop or not. Yes, my White Horses. It's, like, it's tremendously atmospheric, isn't it? really is. It does sound like it could have been from a different era. Almost. Yeah. Great record. I think I'm, I'm, I'm amazed they're from Manchester. Yeah, we've confirmed it. Of... Yeah, basically Manchester. Yeah, there you well, go. There you go. I do like an instrumental. I've got to say, I yeah. do like an instrumental in the dressing room. Do you? Yeah. Yeah. Stop people what? listening. Just carrying about your business. <laughs> There's so much other new music that you come across. There's a Glass Animals uh, track which was on your yeah. uh, list, which yeah, you may well, get to later. Yeah. I mean, I love later with Jules. You know, it's kind of where you see a lot of stuff that you wouldn't normally find you really I, I don't have spotify or anything like that i can't, no. I can't be bothered with that you know now with the advent of uh, uh, record shops shutting i spend a couple of days a, you know a month maybe in record shops on yeah. in, in london but there isn't any anymore well, it almost so. it almost comes back to the sleeve thing as well you can get interested oh, yeah. just by you stand in a shop I, and you go i might listen, buy this i bought many a record with a guy on the front with a tash and a pair of flares on thinking he's got to have written one good song. There's got to be one good song on this record. And uh, remember that band Man? Yes. There's this, one of their, well, they've got a few records. They've got a dreadful album with the best cover I've ever seen. I think I might have bought it twice. Yeah. You know, once in Paris, forgot, for, forgotten how rubbish it was. It's, it's got to be amazing. There's nothing worse than getting home in the days of when I was trying to fill in my record collection and started going to second hand shops. And you go, oh, first magazine album. And uh, I had three copies at one point. Yeah. Every nine months, I'd yeah, forget yeah, yeah. that I had the record yeah, and then go and buy it again. Yeah, I do it all the time download songs and then. Just think, hang on a minute, I've got this four <laughs> times. <laughs> that White Horse is chart, I can see why David Holmes would like it, though. Cause, again, because it sounds quite filmic. And we've got something else, which is very, very much like it's come from a movie in the second half of the of the hour. But that's something... Yeah, well, that's, a, that's David's stock in trade, I think, yeah. is his film soundtracks. Um, he's very, very good at it. Yeah. And are you aware of what's happening in music, apart from there's later, there's your snapshot, but anything else? Current there's, a state band, of- there's a band that a few people who I kind of talk about music going on about this band cabbage yeah 
They're from Manchester. They are from Manchester. And if they're half as good as the name, I can't believe I've never been in a band called Cabbage, Cabbage. before. Yeah, it's the, I think it I might be one of my top ten greatest names of all time. Really? Because I didn't know we'd stand on Cabbage. You know, just cabbage is a name. The Cabbage is oh, brilliant. This is a man who didn't like Arctic Monkeys as a name. Oh, no, but Cabbage is... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cabbage is uh, first EP. Cabbage, it's just brilliant. I mean, I can... The logo, the badges, I can see the badges now. There's merchandise. Tons of them. Their first little press release thing with their first EP had all these... I imagine it was, you know, one-liners from a couple of blogs in the Manchester Evening News or something. Had all these Cabbage, you know, watch out for and yeah. the new sound, the new punk rock sound of the North West. And then uh, underneath, the like, final line was, that's the worst band name of all time, Mark Burgess Chameleons. <laughs> 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 wow. Well, that, that, like them, that band Spring King. Yeah. Got a few of their tunes. What else? Slaves. Yeah. They make a, they good, make racket. a good racket. That, that, exactly. That, that guy's guitar sounds yeah. great. Well, they'd have to be with only him and a drummer. Apparently. But it's quite, it seems to be very much, it's sort of splitting as well, isn't it? The one thing, do you know, my one bugbearer at the moment, I don't know where you stand on this, a record by someone featuring someone Nonsense. else. Nonsense. The entire top 150 are featuring someone else. It's record companies, isn't it? Because it's if you if you can't make the record, don't make a record. If no one wants to buy your record, if you're not good enough to make a record, don't make it. Listen, go the Ivan Avellos, right? See how many people get up to accept a gong for Song of the Year. It's truly incredible. I went there one year, and I have to name drop this. I was sat with Ray Davis, right? Because he was presenting me with an award. Nice, okay, yeah, because that's yeah. what we do. That's a good, and, uh, that's, that's a good lunch. Thing. Yeah, actually, it was very funny. Because he, he turned up late and uh, we're all sat there, huge table, there's like 10, 12 of us, uh, there's loads of booze and there's clearly two empty seats, which is for Ray Davis and his missus and they turn up late and he kind of get <laughs> Ray Davis, it's like, he was, oh, you all drinking then? We were like, yeah, and his missus is going, Ray, have a drink. And he's going, no, I don't want a drink. She's going, have a drink. And we're like, have a drink. And we're pouring him champagne. And then... Uh, with Ivan Avellos, so Emily Sandy won Song of the Year. I can't remember what song it was, and and the winner is Emily Sandy. Wait, eight people got an award for it. Eight people, and I was we was kind of sat there and was like saying to Ray, "How do eight people write a song?" Yeah, I said, if, "If I try and write a song with someone else, it freaks me <laughs> out." I, eight people. I was compelled to go to this table. <laughs> and say to these, "That's the I'll stop what they're doing," and saying, "Yeah, I felt what." How have eight of you written this song? And they're all like, yeah, yeah, sit down, man. Yeah, it was like, well, two of us do the beats. Two of us do the chords. Two do the lyrics. And there's a thing called a top liner. Do you know what a top liner is? That's the guy that when they've done all that, he sits there and goes... Hum in the melody and then yeah. someone else does the words. And I'm saying... It's and I mean, here's a question for you. <laughs> is Emily Sandy doing when all this is going on? Oh, she's at the White House. You know, <laughs> what, I mean, blows my mind. I'm sitting in a room, you know, with a pen and a piece of paper, well, with an iPad now, but thinking, <laughs> can't rhyme how with cow anymore. Can't be done anymore. Hang on a minute. I haven't done that now for 18 years. No one will remember. It's a different generation. <laughs> Let's use shine again. I haven't used hold on for a bit. It's good to hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Noel Gallagher, I guess we've got one more before the news. Uh, it finds us back in the 70s, and this is by Donny and Joe Emerson. That's Donny. If you can find, while uh, we're playing this, a picture of them online, I'd recommend it. Donny and Joe Emerson. Legends. This is Baby. Legends. It's Donny and Joe Emerson. If you did find a photo, look at those collars. Those collars are about four feet tall. They've come as the disco version of Shaking Stevens. Right, we've all been there. <laughs> That is an amazing record, though, because that sort of soul needs a real deafness of touch, doesn't it? Somebody played me that on a... Or somebody gave me uh, the, the the modern equivalent of a mixtape, which yeah. is now a playlist yeah. on a CD, yeah. and that was on it. I recognised the surname. Um, I'm trusting the internet here. They were brothers. Their dad built them a state-of-the-art recording studios on their ranch, and they made this record, and that's all I know. Well, that'll do. Yeah. If that one tune came out of it, then it was worth yeah. it. You know, I wish my old fella had built, built me a studio. Well, these these days, the dad would be paying for them to intern somewhere. Uh, like. Well, yeah. I think it's from the 70s, right? Yeah. When I first heard that, it kind of blew me away. I listened to two or three other tracks, um, simply because the, well, the write-up on the website says, you know, they, they dabbled in all types of music. And they did, and they moved from soul into there's that one, sort of soft one, there's rock. There's a really great of. track called, is it Give Me a Chance? It's got really kind of 
funk wah wah guitar mm. on it. It's amazing. The thing with a record like that as well, and there's there was quite a bit of it around then. I think is how effortless it sounds. It sounds like the song mm. is just falling out of them. But then the day that you got you got in a room and played it, yeah, and then you and then you played it and played it until the version appeared you know yeah. i was watching the the, the the beatles film last night you know the on the road with or whatever it's called eight days a week there's not really a great deal more that you can say about the beatles that hasn't been said but yeah. you know it's nice to listen to them you know about how a song would take shape you know and uh people just don't go in studios anymore and yeah. sit around and say these are the chords join in until somebody says that right that's it let's record it now you know what i mean yeah. it's that kind of everything's done on computers and yeah. so that's why it sounds so effortless because yeah. They were probably not putting a lot of effort in it. <laughs> <laughs> Noel Gallagher is our guest. There'll be more from his record collection after this news. It's Genesis on Six Music. It's the choice of Noel Gallagher, our special guest. This programme last year cost me an absolute fortune. I had to go out and buy that Animals album, that real McCoy track we play all the time yeah, now really? on the programme, which is oh, you're welcome, genius. By the way. Yeah, no, really. Thank you. <laughs> this, though, when I saw the list this year, Genesis, side two, track one from Genesis to Revelation, The Conqueror. Uh, by Genesis, that was the biggest surprise this year. I never. It's just an era of Genesis I didn't know. Well, so I'm on tour, and uh, Chris Sharrock, my drummer, we were talking a little bit hazy in the dressing room. We were talking about something or psychedelic songs that have fallen through the gaps of time. Have you ever heard the Conqueror by Genesis? <laughs> oh, mate, yeah, I won't have anything to do with Genesis, even though I will state now for a fact that I do like Peter Gabriel, and not because he's a dad at our school, and I see him regularly. Right. He's a okay. nice guy. Right, okay. yeah, yeah. And Sledgehammer is a tune, if you're listening, Peter. So the ne- I woke up the next day and he sent me a link to a thing, The Conqueror the, the, by Genesis, and I put it on, and that piano riff, and I'm like, what? He was not ripped that off before. That's a disgrace. <laughs> and on goes the song, and I'm like, now I will tell you, right, the first thing I did was I... Googled it and I was like, if I think who's playing drums on this is playing drums on this, that's it. Then that's it, it's over. It's allowed because he's not playing drums on it. <laughs> he was nowhere near it. If so you- we're allowed to like it and it's brilliant. <laughs> and there's at least, I'd say, six great songs on that first Genesis record, which I'd never even that. heard of. Yeah. It is a terrific... I mean, that track... I, mean, I haven't listened to the rest of it. I will do now. There's a track uh, called Silent Sun, which, honest to God, if you're listening to Peter Gabriel, the lawyers are going to have to get involved pretty soon because I am going to rob that <laughs> endlessly until I can't make music anymore. <laughs> I think I, I was scarred by Can't Already Love when I was a kid. Right. Uh, clearly. But um, So wh- when I'd done my last gig at Brixton Academy, Johnny Marr got up to play with us. I were in the dressing room before, and I said to him, why would you stand on Genesis? And he was like, I might be Genesis. And I was like, what, have you ever heard a track called The Conqueror? No. <laughs> so we put it on, and he sat open-mouthed. And then it came out, well, to be, well, to be honest, Peter Gabriel's first couple of solo records are really good. And I was like, all right, oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So I'll dedicate that to Johnny, who the pair of us sat and then listened to that record and was like, can't believe how good it is. Can't believe how good it is. Yeah. It's brilliant. You must have met, I was thinking about this, how, how many people you meet, and you must have met a lot, a lot of the old school, you mentioned Ray Davis before the news, but people that, you, you must meet a lot, you only got to go to a Mojo Awards or something yeah. and they're all there, but, but the actual question is, ending up in unlikely company at the end of a night, <laughs> that's, the, that's the question, any, any time you've been standing there thinking... Right, I've got Brian May this side. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I've been in a very funny foursome, not sexually, before you go any further, with my missus and Jeff Beck and his missus. Really? Right, yeah. yeah. Jeff Beck doing bird warbling impressions <laughs> at David Gilmore's 70th. Beat that. That's, that's it. Beat that. Yeah. Who else? <laughs> I don't know. I've thrown Paul Weller out. Well, Paul Weller doesn't count anymore because he's like one of my best mates, but I, early on... I remember uh, there's one time round at our house, something had been going on, a, a spontaneous drink had happened and it kind of went on for a while. Yeah. And I remember there was just <laughs> me and him left and I tried to get him out of the house. And I remember as he'd left was thinking, that's so bizarre. It's like only like four years, or like four or five years ago, I had posters of him yeah. on my bedroom wall, my mum's house in Manchester. And you yeah. fast forward and he's just going, 
God, it's exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> Please, can you just go home? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, this, I mean, I've said it already, I haven't heard a lot of these tracks. I hadn't heard this, but again, this, you, uh, so you're not averse to a cinematic soundtrack uh, or a track that sounds like it should be in a film, and this is another one, one of those. This is Bugs, and this is Filed Under X. It's Bugs, it's Filed uh, Under X. That's not all of it. There is, there's another couple of hours of that track, mm-hmm. isn't it? Goes, goes for a while. But it's got that sort of DJ shadow creeping yeah. menace. I don't know how I've come across that. I do spend quite a bit of time surfing iTunes and one thing leads to another mm. and don't, sometimes it's the title of a song or a band or an act that you might have heard somebody mention. You start flicking through and yeah, I don't know anything about these these characters, yeah. nothing about them at all but when I first heard that track I was like, oh wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Almost like the Gorillas or something. Yeah. And it's, it's one of those things where you think, I wonder what's going to happen next. Even yeah. If, even if nothing does yeah. happen, you're well, always thinking, it, what, what are they, where? There's a track what? that's like that by a guy called Washington Phillips right. called Masterpiece, which, which is as long. It's kind of like that's from the 70s, very slow, but kind of amazed that, like, Kanye's not sampled it or mm. something. I like stumbling across things like that. Mm. I think I, I, people, when I, if I've got that on in dressing rooms, people say, who's this? And I'm like, no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Has no Good idea. don't it? Yeah, that's one yeah. of my demos. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard the Anchor song? I'm always very loath. After we had that conversation about <laughs> people recommending you music, you going away and going... This is terrible. Mm. What were they thinking? Have you heard the Anchor Song album? It's a Japanese producer. Came out this year. No. Really? A couple Guitars? Of tracks. Electronic? No, electronic? Electronic, but good. Right. Good electronic. Oh. Yeah. Spot right, on. I'll down somebody. I <laughs> shall so, so get that for my wife for Christmas. <laughs> She'll be thrilled. Do the offers come in for you to do film work? I have been asked once or twice, and I've agreed and then bottled it at the last minute. Have you? Yeah. Why? I don't know whether you've noticed this, Steve, but I'm not really... I'm not, you know, I'm not really... I don't think I've got the face for the silver screen just yet. <laughs> I've, yeah, I've been asked to be in a couple of things, and I'm like, kind of like, yeah, off. Oh, well, of course, you know. The third cowboy, I could make that role on my own. Third prison officer, <laughs> that's me. And then it kind of comes to it and just said, yeah, no, I've moved to Thailand. I can't, I can't do it now. I've moved to Thailand, and I've been arrested in Thailand, and I'm currently on death row. And somehow I managed to get my way out of it. You, you are, of course, though, which you mean. I've been Star Wars. If any, if J.J. Abrams is listening, or whoever's doing yeah. the next one, obviously in a helmet. Yeah. Or somewhere, you know. Right. I could, I could probably be a good stormtrooper. I used to know a guy, <laughs> but in the 90s when I first moved to London, he used to claim that he was in the in the first Star Wars, the first, you know, the New Hope, the original one. <clears throat> When you first see the stormtroopers, when they come on to Princess Leia's ship, he used to claim that he was the first stormtrooper to get killed. <laughs> he was sitting there thinking, now, he was, a, he was a large gentleman. How would you even be able to cry? He's like, yeah, I was, I was one of the stormtroopers in Star Wars, and we're kind of all out of it going, really? No way, what was Darth Vader like? You know, because he's a real person, Darth Vader. Yeah. He's not like a Cornish dude. And... Uh, that's the age of I think. That's such nonsense. <laughs> like you could walk around saying, you know, my dad's the Stig. <laughs> you know, not that that would impress anybody, you know, but... It kind of, yeah, I know I was the first Stormtrooper. But you, are, you are in a film. We mentioned, we, 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 passed, uh, we yeah. sort of glossed over at Supersonic, which playing, came out. Playing a version of myself, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't believe there was so much old footage. Well, th- here's the thing. When they were putting together the film, and you're having these meetings, and a guy's going, do you know of any footage? And I'm like, look, going, mate, it's not like anybody's walking around with this. Yeah, with a, If with there a was footage, there'd have to be a guy with a camera yeah. on his shoulder this big. And we would have noticed there's no way there's any footage of, what, you found 14 hours of footage in the dressing room? Where have you got that from? <laughs> I'm like, what's the thing? I don't recall any of this. No. And even as I'm talking clearly drunk into the camera, I'm thinking, I have no recollection of this at all. And they said it must have been someone stood there, because it's like the early 90s. There was no mini cameras it would have been a big camera just goes to show doesn't it yeah some of it quite re- you know quite revealing I, th- I mean I really en- I really enjoyed the early days yeah the, the telling the story of the early days I mean there's obviously everyone sort of knows the story but I think there was they didn't it, there's enough in it to make you think I, I think yeah. what the thing why people have responded to the film so well is it finishes at the right point yeah so it doesn't discuss the long protracted fallout which nobody wants to get into that yeah so it's kind of the this rise to this the biggest thing, the biggest gigs at that time that ever was. So it's all about the glory. I think Liam comes out of it quite well as some kind of mad drunken mystic, you know, from another time. 
if only that had lasted, you know. <laughs> when I finished watching it and had to sign off on it, I was saying, honestly, if this doesn't inspire people to pick up guitars, yeah. then I don't know what will. Yeah. You know, because you know, no one in that band was a genius. No one. Not even, you know what I mean? Not even me. And I wrote all the songs. It's quite sad in a way, because it, 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 it kind of shines a light on the way the music business was, you know, when, particularly for guitar music, which is, hasn't got, uh, a, it's not a presence anymore on national radio. Mm. And, you know, it makes you feel kind of happy that it happened, but kind of quite sad that it's not like that anymore. I mean, the interview footage, it's always like we were on telly every weekend. Mm. There's so many youth TV, but I don't say youth TV programmes, but programmes where you were performing or being interviewed. And being interviewed every Friday with a pint of lager and a cig <laughs> going, yeah, she's rubbish, you know. Oh, then nonsense, you know, slagging yeah. everybody off. Yeah, and um, it, it, it was you could you could have actually just said. I mean, it sounds like uh, this one that uh, sort of cliched old phrase: five guys from Manchester living the dream. But it was live the dream. I've had a lot of texts from younger people. Like my the first thing my daughter said is she's seen the film and she said, "Well, um, yeah." I thought she'd gone about the language and all that. She said, "Where's all those jumpers that you used to wear?" <laughs> and I was like, "The jumpers." And she said, have you got any of the old clothes? And I went, no, probably in a bin bag somewhere, like underneath a bridge in the Thames. She's like, God, those jumpers are great. I, a few of the younger kind of people in the music industry I know through Grimmy were texting saying, wow, we had no idea it was like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that's a good thing then that you're kind of reminded about the top 40 yeah. was, a, was a little bit wild. Yeah. You know, top of the pops and all the... You were interviewed and there was... Nobody had media training. Yeah. Here, like Alan McGee, I've got to take a lot of credit for that because they... And Tony Wilson and all those people that own those indie record labels, they laid the foundations for all that. Where yeah. it, anything went. And I was out with um, Steve Mackey the other day from Pulp and uh, we were talking about it and it was like, it's a good document of a bygone era which ends on a glorious note. You know, it doesn't kind of yeah. show the fallout, which is what which is what I like about it. There's so much interest as well, and around that, you've got Jill's exhibition, uh, the Oasis DNA exhibition. Jill oh, lovely Jill there, taking uh, pictures to this day. She still follows me around with a camera. This Be Here Now went straight in, back into the top five, the latest yeah, in a series I, of reissues. Yeah, the film so, itself has got a lot of great reaction in America. Is it? Yeah, which is amazing, because it wasn't subtitled, because we used to get subtitled on the TV over there all the back catalogue kind of went shooting up the charts to, yeah. you know, the top 700, you know, after so maybe, that, the back so of it. That's, that is another generation then, you know, maybe it is doing the things that you wanted to do. Uh, we're, I'm conscious we're running out of time again. We're going to play another track. Let's play, let's play Murray Head, because just that's the daftest wow. name. Murray Head. D well, Murray Head, I'm going to dedicate this song to the lovely Sarah, my wife, well, that's my beautiful wife. This song is called She Was Perfection. This might be one of the most perfect songs I've ever heard. It's unbelievable. Murray Head and She Was Perfection and... I think he was in the... I think he was in the action. What Murray Head was? I think he was. <laughs> Murray Head. Yeah. I think he was in the action. The, I know you know the action because I think I heard an action record because I think I got into them through a band called The Prisoners. Do you remember The Prisoners? All right. Like okay. 90s, uh, uh, they've 80s. got... Uh, there's one great song called I See You. It might not even be their song. It might even be by The Birds or something. But it's like live at the BBC. It's amazing. Really good. Just before we let you go, how far... You always write. You always pick up mm. this art. You're always writing. I feel like I'm out of a job if I'm not doing something. Right. Well, so, I'm, not just, I'm not justifying my, myself. Uh, because, I don't know. I've, I've I'm always, no one without a guitar. I've, I've always... If I'm taking time off, then I'd rather be on holiday. Because if I'm at home, yeah, I don't really do a great deal. I'm not one for sitting in a pub all day anymore, because no one else is. I don't really have hobbies like golf. Somebody said to me once, I want to amuse. Do you play golf? I was like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> no. No. People used to sell, sell me, get a hobby, it'll be good for you. Get a well, hobby. I, I, get but a people hobby. say that to me, get a hobby, it's like, what? this is my hobby, yeah. what I do. Noodling is my hobby. I do write, I was doing it this morning, I'm kind of finishing off this record. So here's the thing, so, so how many, I was thinking, over the course of a couple of years now, you must have a backlog of songs, mm -hmm. uh, and then you come in and you say, well, I'm, I'm working on a record. Yeah, which uh, all the songs that I was writing towards making a record have not been used because when we decided to make a record with David Holmes, he works that all the writing gets done in the studio. That's apparently that's what producers do. I've, this is new on me. Why? I don't know. I've no really? idea. Yeah. So I so we started started this record at his house in Belfast. 
So does that make it more <clears throat> spontaneous? Because yeah, we actually doing started it, on the, it on the day that Lou Reed died. That was that was the thing on the way to the. So this album has been <laughs> dogged by death of pop stars in it. The process is the complete opposite to the way that I've always worked for the last thirty years, which is you write a song, you kind of work on it, chip away at it till you think right, this is great. You go in the studio, put it down. You say right, want it sound like this, and you head for that direction. With this is kind of. You have no idea what you've got until it's there. And the end results are great because they're constantly evolving. Yeah. Process is kind of like, you know, you're it's two steps forward, sometimes ten back to take one sideways, and then a moment of inspiration will take you somewhere else. Mm. But it's been an education, I've got to say, with David. It was something that I would all, I would always have backed away from in the past. I'm not right in the studio. I'm not doing that. And uh, I've really, really enjoyed it. I just thought it'd be so much sort of pressure because you're conscious that, you know, time's elapsing, you get to the end of the day, you haven't really done out. You do you know? get the odd phone call from people who are in charge of the purse strings at my record label, I might add, that I run, <laughs> that is funded by my brilliance, OK? Is, have you finished the thing yet? No. When do you think you're going to get it finished? <laughs> like, I have no idea. Only, you know, it's kind of uh, the budget. No, it's like, don't tell me about budgets. It's like, it's my money. It's my money. We're going to have to speak to Marcus as my manager. You get someone else saying, well, we're going to have to speak to Marcus about this. I was like, never mind, Marcus. <laughs> if Marcus wants to chip in, then he gets an opinion. Fortunately, I think I think we're ending to the home straight now. Right. So and you're going to be lenient with yourself and give you another, give you an extension I've, of the time. Yeah, I've been given the deadline, which is to have everything finished, and that's everything mastered artwork videos the lot done by the time i go to glastonbury in june and that sounds like a way away but it's kind of not you yeah. know what i mean yeah and then once it's all done i can have the rest of next summer writing more songs for an album that'll never get released so i've got tons now i've got i say finished i've got a couple of albums worth material and stuff that really? stuff that's nearly finished four albums worth i think Christ that have just got a knock into shape yeah going to glastonbury next year you know what's going to happen somebody's tweeting already i go to glastonbury every year and when i'm not working and honestly the amount of you brought your guitar no is liam with you no, no. Uh, well one thing uh, at least we know we, are you doing the secret gig at the egyptian <laughs> tent at four o'clock in the morning no <laughs> and neither will we be for, yeah. for a while yet. Uh, it's brilliant. It's, it's nice to know that you're working because as soon as anyone says, you know, as soon as you say, oh, yeah, I've got some time off, that's when the, the phone calls start coming, isn't it? Will you be on Question Time? Will you do Celebrity Jungle? I, do, I get asked to go on Question Time a lot. Do you? Yeah, I've been asked a few times. and um, Not fancy, it? I don't like seeing people that clearly shouldn't be on there, on there, like Russell Brand, you know. Actually... It was better than one of his stand-up routines because all he did was sit there and go, I agree with what that guy's just said up there. It's like, I think he's missing the point of this. I think the point is is to kind of express your opinion about a question, not just say, so, Russell, what do you think about the price of frogs? Well, what I just agree with that guy just said up there, it's like, well, that's not good enough. Man. I'm paying the B, I'm paying the taxpayer here. This is not good enough. When you see people on there, it should be for politicians, not for... I think that's... I think that's crept into politics recently is the celebrity endorsement of yeah. political views and i always find that a bit uh having got involved in that way back in the 90s to a lesser extent uh question time i've always politely declined i would be bound to say something that would, <laughs> that would be kind of offensive to most people <laughs> we'll, we'll scratch that one off the list there you go there's a researcher who's very sadly putting down a phone yeah. <laughs> scrubbing a name I off the list have to go on top gear a lot and they would never, ever seem to realise what I was saying when I was saying, but I can't drive. Don't worry about that. Jeremy will sort that out. I was like, ow, I can't drive. I haven't got a licence. I cannot drive a car. Don't worry about that. The Stiggle teacher. I was like, stop it, will. <laughs> Are we have to go and Strictly Come Dancing? Have you? I had that on, on my joke list of, you know, is this one of the sort of things? But I suppose, of course, people would ask you to go on something like that. It like was that. just when Oasis split up. And uh, you I, 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 it was when I hadn't, I didn't do anything for like a couple of years. Yeah. There's obviously someone there going, you know what? <laughs> He'll be up for it now. He'll be desperate now. And my manager will come and say, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't really want to. I have, legally, I have to inform you of this. Are you aware of Strictly Come Dancing? Like, Ding. 
in the phone call. There's nothing that, uh, you know, your daughter said, oh, do that one. Go on, do she, that yeah, one. Yeah, she wanted me to do the X Factor, yeah. Right. And but just, no. I can't be bothered uh, being on. So I'd t- work all that kind of thing, you know what I mean? <laughs> I think we mentioned this before. It takes too long. You'd have to be there every Saturday. You'd be there every Saturday night. You'd miss football. As well as sitting there in, you know, a Birmingham Arena, sitting there thinking, oh, can kill me now. <laughs> Someone else flying without wings. This is just appalling. Clearly, just you know, no. Let's go back to a uh, better time and finish with. Well, it's, I mean, it's been fantastic again. And, um, well, I'm coming back to something, someone we've touched on before. But let's finish with Dion and this. Well, but, I mean, there was a lot to Dion that we don't know. This album is produced by Phil Spector, and when you hear it, you'll go, "Of course it is," because it's the slowest song of all time with the biggest drum sound. And uh, I didn't realise this, that he, he, he produced this album by Dion. David Holmes played it to me one day in the studio. And, incidentally, I think round about the same time, he produced an album for Leonard Cohen, who's also Did died he? this year. Yeah. And uh, this album by Leonard Cohen is called Death of His Ladies Man. The track on that album called Death of His Ladies Man is amazing. It's got... It's, Phil Spector's a genius. But Dion... I mean, I'll come in next year and play you Born to Cry unbelievable uh, the guy's got such a great voice and he's gone from doo-wop through psychedelia to whatever we would class this as now yeah. but i just really just him singing the the hymn you've got the whole yeah. he's got the whole world in his hands with phil Spector production but it's amazing but yeah dion is he still alive i'd like to think he is come on dion, dion dead or alive. this is us? like the old simon mayo is Mayo's he still it? with us yeah. dion he's still with us get in touch is he still making records his last record? Well, he's got one out of the minute. 2016. I'm buying that right now. What's it called? New York is my home. There you go. Don't, I'm going to buy that right now. Don't, don't buy it. It's near Christmas and people will want to know at least I'm one thing. St- I'm going to stream it right now. <laughs> Put one third of half a pence in his pocket. <laughs> no, we're going to go. Thank you very much for coming in once again. Pleasure. Have a lovely Christmas. You we'll too. see you next year. Indeed you will.